so what you're going to hear next is a uh, interview that I did with Keith Raboy at Miami Tech Week. Uh, obviously, I am not a professional interviewer. Uh, so and Keith and I are, are definitely friendly. And so uh, it's a little bit of just a, uh, a casual conversation. We went into a bunch of different stuff, which you'll you'll hear. And uh, yeah, he's he's never short on opinions. And so definitely a fun conversation. Excited for you to hear it. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm here today with uh, with Keith Raboy. We are here for Miami Tech Week, so I figured we'd do it in person. Thanks for doing this, Keith. Welcome to Miami. Yes, I. Uh, so for Keith and I are friendly. I, I whatever the line in between that I get him to do this, but also not the line to his uh, to his very fun birthday parties that I've heard a lot about. So whatever <laughs> whatever that middle group is, uh, but we also share an investment in uh, in Ramp together. Yeah. So at least you picked a good company. I know. I know. Well, I, I need you to filter more of those my way. Um, so yes. Yes, we are here. We have quite a contingency for Redpoint uh, down this week. We're excited to see what what is. I guess this is the second Miami Tech Week. It is. So Delian, uh, my colleague at Founders Fund, started Tech Week last year. He really wanted an excuse to move his younger friends to Miami. Yep. And so we created uh, Tech Week as a way to overcome the inertia and get people to visit Miami. And then this year we've blown it out like 10x. I we were actually invited to a closing party for Miami Tech Month. So now it's it's turning. It's really there's a sprawl going on here. It with, is um, between Bitcoin NFT Week. Uh, yeah, every every everybody in tech is here this month. Everybody who is anybody in tech has been here this month. The uh, and then I guess FTX is next week in the Bahamas, and that I mean that's like a you know whatever a county of the of well, Miami. Well, then we come back with F one. Uh, oh yeah, so you're yeah, ready for F one, which is. Apparently, like the hottest sports ticket. I was talking to some of my friends that are like huge sport guys, and they said it's just going to be insane trying to get seats. The hotel, uh, the the hotel rates for the year are never higher or have never been higher than they are for early May, which is you know past the peak season of weather. So it's going to be an epic event in Miami. Is this the first time they've done that, or is yeah, it- this is the first time Miami's hosted an F one race. But it's going to be incredible. It's actually fascinating this drive to survive thing. It's such an interesting taking this like little niche sport and blowing it out, and now Miami leaning into it. Miami's leaning into it. Vegas just announced they're going to do a nighttime F one, which would be super exciting. But everybody's coming here for that weekend. Um, it's going to be equivalent to Art Basel. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, so obviously you've uh, so you moved to Miami in December. Of- December tenth, two thousand and twenty. 2020. So we're, we're what, 15 months, 16 months at this point. Uh, so you, you, I know you've told the story before, but the, the criteria you were thinking about in picking a city, you were fed up with the Bay Area to say? Yeah. This? So we were fed up. My husband and I were fed up with uh, the COVID restrictions, the lockdown, the crime, the homelessness, and the taxation, the regulation. We, and our diagnosis was everything was going to get worse before we get better. And we didn't want to sit through the curve as, you know, waste years of our lives as everything was getting worse before, you know, one day there'd be like light at the end of the tunnel. So we started filtering cities of where we can move to both professionally and personally, both at Founders Fund and internally in our family. And our family criteria was simply warm weather, access to an international airport, cosmopolitan food and uh, shopping in a Barry's boot camp, just apply in a a tax rate below 4.5%. You apply those five criteria and there's no cities except Miami in the US. And, and, uh, And then the big other one was international airport, right? Yeah, international airport was pretty critical, uh, partially so people could visit us, founders, et cetera, and partially because I do have to yeah, travel. Over to, yeah, uh, and that, that's the one that, uh, uh, I, my family's all from Nashville and uh, Nashville's near and dear to my heart. And uh, yeah, I think that was where it seems like it, it worked out to your yes. to your benefit, to Miami's benefit, all that, but what could have been uh, in some ways. If Nashville yeah, Nashville had... was disqualified of the founders fund list explicitly due to the lack of international airports. Yeah, that's a bummer. Austin too, in some ways, really doesn't have an international airport. Yeah, they, it, Austin's an interesting one because they were such a. It was it was like kind of the third or fourth tech city for so long, and it feels like they kind of flubbed. The oh yeah, no one prominent in tech has moved since I announced I was coming to Miami. Is that right? Yeah, you're capturing that outflow. Oh, uh, it's absolutely. a zero sum opportunity between. Yeah, I mean, it kind of is. I mean, well, I don't know if it's zero sum, but strictly speaking. There are people who have more and less influence. People are going to be more and less successful. And I want 99% of them here. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Now, how do you think about, uh, I, I feel like I, I, it's weird. I was, I was, before you're starting, it's a, it's a weird straw man of like the San Francisco advocate or, or supporter, which there are some still out there, believe it or not, uh, the dyed in the wool. I am, I am not that. I think San Francisco has a, has a role in the overall tech ecosystem. But how do you think about like the public uh, drawing to people to Miami, and is it is it at the expense of San Francisco? Is it at the expense of other cities? How do you sort of think about where San Francisco is today? 
Well, I think San Francisco is the next Detroit. I think the writing's on the wall, and it'll look obvious in hindsight. Everybody be like, "Well, of course it's Detroit," but right, it, it, you know, Detroit took ten years to fall apart. Um, it was the epicenter of American business in the United States for 20, 30, 40 years. And then it fell apart within a decade and it's taken 30, 40 years to rebuild. And that's going to happen in the Bay Area. So fundamentally right now, the way I think about Miami is Miami is the future. So you can either be part of the past or the future. And some people opt in to be part of the past. They're old, they're aged, their brain doesn't, isn't that flexible anymore. And there's people who are embracing the future and they're all moving to Miami. I'm going to get uh, a hard time for not pushing back on some of these things. And I want to, I want to you, you should push back because I'll give you evidence. No, 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 I don't, I don't actually don't even believe uh, any of the arguments I would actually have. I, I actually <laughs> kind of on your side with a lot of these things, but I, uh, no, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the proof's in the pudding now. And so, so was, uh, the original mission for, uh, Miami tech week and doing this whole thing together from Delian's mind, was it to get, was it to convince people that were kind of Bay? I mean, obviously other cities as well, but Bay area native to see the light at the end what, of the tunnel. The, the best metaphor I, uh, I'm going to borrow from someone else is Miami's like a, a addictive consumer app. And the problem with a new app for consumers, you have to initiate that download. Like yeah. until you get people to try your app. Yeah. You have no idea of convincing them about the engagement and the quality. So a lot of people have never been to Miami, especially from California. Yeah. New Yorkers have always yeah. been to Miami for a variety of reasons, but a lot of my California friends had never been here. So we needed to create an excuse to overcome that inertia. And then when people come here, they're very pleasantly surprised. They see the most, most arresting experience to start is people are happy. That was the one thing I didn't realize when I moved here was how happy everybody would be. You go to a coffee shop, you go to a restaurant, you go to a bar, you go to Barry's Boot Camp, wherever you go, you will find happy people inevitably. And that's made it easy to layer on new people because people want to be around, happiness is contagious. And so people want to be around happy people. I'll tell you a quick anecdote. I had a friend of mine in technology visit me last June uh, from North Carolina where he had relocated to his family during COVID. And we went to dinner and I told him how everybody here is happy. And he kind of, you know, smiled at dinner. And then I took him to a housewarming party of some friends of ours who had moved to New York and introduced him to 30 people at this party. And so we were driving home after dinner and he, he looks at me and he said, you know what? I didn't believe you at dinner at all, but every single one of those 30 people I met at that party was, was happy. Yeah. And you're like, is it drugs? Is it the weather? Like, what's going on? <laughs> it's definitely not drugs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not at my party. I, yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, we're in the founders of an office and uh, I've heard colloquially referred to as Miami Keith because uh, everyone said, now you're in such a good mood walking around here. Yeah. I mean, well, it's impossible. I mean, sunlight, you know, vitamin D and stuff. Like totally. That, it contributes to it. There's lots of research behind that. But happiness is absolutely contagious. So I once interviewed Patrick Carlson at the CEO Summit for Coastal Ventures. And I asked him, how do you have a culture at Stripe where everybody's happy? Because everybody I knew at Stripe was happy. Yep. And he said, I don't do anything. I just hire people who are already happy. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, you filter yeah, the right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so there's some of that. But yeah, you can't come here and not be happy. And so my thesis was originally was people are like, how are you going to get engineers to move? That was a big critique of like Miami. I was like, engineers are people. Humans have been humans since Shakespeare. So the same things that appeal to humans are going to appeal to engineers. I just need to clarify that, communicate that, amplify that, and we'll have all the engineers here. And they are. So I, have a, I run a company, a CEO, while I'm investing, and we have now 40 engineers. 75 to 80% have moved to Miami. We could easily double that engineering team in the next quarter or two if we want to. Yeah. We'll have to see whether we need that many engineers right away. But fundamentally, we go to New York, we go to Chicago, we go to LA, and we go to the Bay Area, and we tell people, you're going to be happy, and you're going to be professionally challenged. Yeah. And, and so the Miami, like, in willing it into existence, which I think yeah. you and Delian and, yep. uh, have done that, like, is it, is it kind of a pet project? Is it because you'll be at the nucleus of this, and therefore it's great uh, investment opportunities will come out of it? Like, how do you actually think about willing all this into- I think existence? it's like starting a company. It's yeah. no different. When you start a company, everybody around you thinks it's ridiculous. It's never going to work. They have all the criticisms, all the reasons it won't work. And then you have to overcome inertia. And inertia is not your friend, and time is not your friend. And then you have to find ways of uh, overcoming that inertia. And then eventually you get momentum, and then the network effects kick in. So when I first moved to Miami, I went to a dinner that Sunday night with the mayor and like about 13 people. That was the entire successful version of Miami and tech. Yeah. Now, and I did handcraft, like every single person I wanted to move here was like handwork that, have them stay at my house. I'd entertain them. I'd put a program of things to do and test out Miami. Now people want to move to Miami. I don't have to do anything. Yeah. There's such a network of I haven't been invited to your there's house There's thousands yet. of people. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's literally thousands of people here, hundreds who've, who've been very successful yeah. in tech. So yeah, I may help connect the dots here and there, or there might be someone who's so strategic, I might 
use a little bit of my time yeah. to help, you know, navigate Miami for them. But that's it. it this is just propelling. And like, I, I had a birthday, my birthday's in March. So I had a birthday party. Already three people, March 17th is my birthday. Three people from that birthday party have already bought a place in Miami. Well, specifically, I've heard your birthday parties are a really good time. So it's not totally surprising. They're, they're boring as hell, but they're a good excuse yeah, for exactly. get people to come to visit to Miami. Yes, that's exactly right. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I'm excited for, I mean, we're, so we're recording this on Tuesday. We have, uh, it really is picking up what Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of like all the events and stuff, but it really is stacked in. I mean, it's every, it seems like someone made the joke that's a lot of VCs, but I actually, I mean, I know a lot of operators as well that are flying in for the event or are already here in the ecosystem. So I'll give you my radical theory behind the Miami movement that I can now prove empirically was the correct thesis, but a lot of people disagreed with me initially. So my thesis was having studied Silicon Valley, been old enough to have actually worked with the people who built Silicon Valley yeah. at the tail end of their career as I was starting mine, and then having read everything about the history sure. of Silicon Valley that could be read. I had a specific view about what made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley. And I said, I'm just going to recreate that in Miami. And my diagnosis was the key to Silicon Valley was actually the investors. It was a, a set of people that had a very different risk appetite that all co-located. And that's what made Silicon Valley. It wasn't Stanford. It wasn't the weather. It wasn't this counterculture. That's all nonsense. I, so the first thing I did is I'm going to move the investors here. I'm going to move angel investors. I want to move VCs. If you look at my goals that I announced when I moved here is I want five competitive uh, firms to Founders Fund to open offices in Miami in the first year. I want the VCs in the ecosystem of angel investors to be the best possible place in the planet for them. And the founders will move here secondarily. And that's exactly what happened. Now, the reason why I say I can prove this theory is there's a great new book written about the history of venture capital called Power Law. Yeah. And he argues this thesis yeah. um, perfectly. Um, and so now I have a complete book to give people who don't believe in the Keith hypothesis, but I've been running this playbook for 16 months before the book was pumped. Totally. I was, uh, I was actually annoyed when it came out because I, I, I think one of the things I had done was piece together a lot of that stuff. And you really have to, I mean, it was like pretty onerous process of like going to old Don Valentine interviews yeah. or like watching, you know, YouTube's clips of him speaking at Stanford or like Cal has a big resource of information about that stuff. And he packaged it up in such a like easy, consumable way. It's that, a great book. I highly recommend anybody yeah. interested in both entrepreneurialism or venture capital. But yes, specifically, I was lucky enough that when I started my career in Silicon Valley, I got to work with Pierre Lamont. Yeah. I got to be on the board with Dick Kremlin. So I absorbed a lot of their history, you know, through that experience. And then, you know, 22 years of doing it myself, basically pieced together all these pieces. So I didn't have to go backwards too much. There was maybe the first generation of like the Traders 8 National Semiconductor. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know them. Yeah. But the next generation from, I didn't know Don, you know, et cetera. Totally. Next generation I got to meet and get to work with, yeah. which is really exciting. That's why I had this view in the back of my head of what really mattered was different than what people reflexively were articulating. Totally. No, that's interesting. It's, uh, yeah, I I'm excited to see all the people that come through. It seems like uh, there's a very loud group of, uh, it's all the very online people that I know are definitely here. And then there's like a long list of people that are like not broadcasting it, but are also definitely coming through. Oh yeah. I mean, like last night was the first night and I was at a dinner and then a party and ran into a ton of people that have not broadcast yet yeah, exactly. here that are very successful and very interesting. Totally. I just bumped into uh, one in your office here that's for true. a board meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I don't, I, he's, he's definitely not going to publicly proclaim it, but we'll, uh, yeah. Well, that's, he, he's not going to have a choice because the founders he's working with are going to post a photo of him here oh, yeah. um, later today. Yeah, okay. So there's actually going to be evidence of it. Uh, well, that's good. You moved out to San Francisco in 90... Uh, 2000. Okay, I, I thought it was before that. Uh, and where are we, what does this remind you of right now uh, in Miami? Well, other people have told me that have very high fidelity experiences that it's more like New York 2008. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard this from a lot of people who actually built New York technology sure. in 2008. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't there, although I participated. I grew sure. up in New Jersey, New York, and you know, lived in New York. So I understood it. But I think that's the best metaphor. Yeah, not, yeah. The venture metaphor is we're at like a Series B company. Yeah. We went quickly from C to Series B. Now we have to prove that we can scale this. Yeah. When, what, what do you think in 10 years, what, what does the geographic dispersion look like? You know, 2032 of uh, dollars from venture. What, what's the split? Yeah, so, so I don't care what mediocre venture capitalists do, but I care what we do at Founders Fund. Yeah. So the criteria I set was going to be our new fund should have equal dollars allocated to Miami in the entire Bay Area. Wow. So in the last fund, and this is looking backwards, so a lot of bias here. We were 24% Bay Area and 9 or 10% Miami. And I only moved here halfway through that fund cycle. Mm. 
So we're almost caught up. Run rate, it's probably- Yeah, so I expect this new fund to be about hopefully 15 or 16% Miami, and hopefully the Bay Area is no more than 15 or 16%. Wow. That'd be a pretty significant accomplishment. Totally. It's crazy. In three years to go from zero to on par with the Bay Area for Founders Fund would be amazing. Yeah, well, and especially, I mean, in mass, it's what, 45% probably Bay Area still. So obviously a lagging indicator. Yeah, but I think we'll have other funds follow us. Yeah. And, you know, the disadvantage of venture is you get an advantage for about one to three years. Yeah. And, and the then people emulate is. what's working. Yeah. So I suspect a lot of funds will be copying our strategy in Miami. Yeah, well, uh, there's a lot of people here that are scouting it out. So uh, good. Well, uh, shifting gears a little bit. So uh, you're, we originally, I originally, uh, exchange notes with you over Twitter. Your uh, Twitter persona, I think, is renowned. Uh, and it's a little bit of, uh, if people Talk are- about a pot and kettle. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that, that's fair, yeah, to, 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 to people here that uh, maybe have a little bit of a distinction of their in-person. But how do you think about, like, uh, it's clearly something of a marketing, I don't know, if it's, it's just fun and you you mess around and have a good time with it, or how, do you think about a marketing strategy? I can tell you my, my view of it, but- Well, it is a marketing strategy in some extent. I learned this when I was working at Square, I read every single tweet about Square for almost three years. And what I realized is that you could amplify value propositions by retweeting real users' experiences yeah. and that VCs noticed this and it helped us with race money <laughs> and it helped with recruiting. So that experience bled into other things I've done professionally. I launched you know, Open Door, I tweet about Open Door, became a VC, tweet about our portfolio companies and about our brand at both Coastal and now Founders Fund. And so it is a marketing platform and it does resonate because the target audiences are pretty similar. People who use Twitter, follow Twitter, tend to overlap with the people who are interested in technology. The flip side is I also have a large following now and I felt like I would be neglecting the advantages of having a following if on some issues I didn't proselytize. Yeah. I felt like I have 300,000 followers. If there's things that are important to me in my life, I should talk about them because otherwise, what am I doing with this audience? Like, so I do talk about issues that transcend, you know, pure marketing for the fund. And I think that makes it more interesting for many of my followers, probably alienates a few, but fundamentally it's mostly used professionally and personally to move ideas forward that I believe the world needs to hear. Yeah. And I think you were the first I, uh, that taught me a very important lesson of not necessarily to engage with, uh, with, uh, bad faith arguments. And, uh, I think notoriously wrong is, uh. Yeah, that was an old Squareism. So there's this one annoying person who kept writing the stupidest tweets about Square. But because I was running a company, you can't always like share all the reasons why. Totally. And but it, but I didn't want the and you've record. already lost if we're arguing. Yeah, and you don't. I, but I didn't want the record. Like people to assume like, well, they read this tweet about Square it must be true. So I wanted to authoritatively say it's not true factually. And so I got in this debate using the wrong thing. It became kind of an internal kind of an amusing thing. Like a lot of yeah. our company meetings would have various tweets with my little wrong comments. So I kept that up a little bit. Maybe I should get rid of it and try something new. I well, I, I like it. I, I I will use a uh, a screenshot of version of it occasionally when uh, when someone else is being bad faith. So it works it works well for me. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, I mean it's an interesting marketing platform to the extent that you can. Uh, I, I've seen your views. Uh, the companies I think have benefited from the awareness of it. I oh, mean, definitely. I mean, uh, there are times when in a competitive situation, like very hyper competitive, I'm competing with other VCs who are good, you know, to lead an investment round. Some of the founders do, well, many of the founders do reference checks, but one of the things that resonates with them is they're definitely significant founder CEOs who I've worked with will say, like when the company needed help, like defense, you know, in articulation of why they were succeeding when the rest of the world was against them, I would use my platform and my following to help them. Yeah. And that's a real value when something goes wrong. Yeah. So that's helpful. The bad side or the flip side of the crazy side of how to Twitter over the last decade is I decided to chase this fool's errand of correcting everything wrong on the internet, yeah. which is just a bad idea. There's so many bad, there's so many dumb things on the internet yeah. that I need to be more disciplined about trying to correct everything wrong that someone publishes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to try to be more, uh, you know, focus my time on something else. What? Yeah, yeah. Correcting everyone on the internet that's wrong, I think, is a uh, endless exercise. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you might lose that battle. Uh, so I guess just because we're talking about it, what do you think about? Uh, it, we don't necessarily need to go into the different personalities bidding on Twitter right now, but what do you think about like the core fundamental problems of either the business, the platform, the opportunity that could be with someone that you used to work with or like, what do you think of Twitter today? Well, I, I think Twitter's a mess. Um, partially it's been underperforming, um, you know, probably product velocity, but consistency and high fidelity. It's the most important social platform. So to be clear, my views have been consistent. You can read 
tweets from the last decade, the most important social platform in the world is Twitter. In because of, impact of in influence society, and impact yeah. in society, yeah. input of countries globally, period, no exception to that. However, could it be a better business with more value and more value creation? Absolutely. But more importantly, it's ideologically bankrupt right now. Um, the new regime is anti-speech. And the whole point of Twitter is to give people unheard voices, long tail voices, more of a platform, less gatekeepers, more access, more democratization. And the new regime thinks their job is to censor. And so I'm very happy to see that people who don't believe in censorship are trying to do things, whether it's directly, indirectly, buy, acquire, run, whatever, to solve this problem. The world needs to hear more voices with a more diverse set of views, not less voices, more controlled by people who already have power. What do you, what do you think of, um, I mean, the, the specific examples that come to mind on the, like, suppressing voices and all that, maybe you have a better example, but obviously the, uh, the Hunter Biden laptop thing very specifically sure. and the president being kicked off the platform after January. 4th. Well, I think kicking the president off the platform where you have Putin literally on the platform today yeah. is completely, in, like, completely indefensible. Yeah. Like, there's no way you can have Putin tweeting and Trump ban. Like, Trump is not going out murdering people, like, yeah. for fun. Yeah. Like, that, that just makes no sense. So there's just a subjectivity to the it's rules. It's not even subjectivity. It's, like, ideologically, intellectually, and ideologically bankrupt. In addition, there are clearly people on Twitter suppressing things that are critical of the CCP. Yeah. Like, so, for example, my husband wrote a policy paper on, that was published by Foreign Policy, the, the most elite foreign policy, you know, sort of publication on the planet, that Twitter will not let him buy ads against. There's no possible defense for that, except that someone works for the CCB at Twitter. And I've tried to get this fixed and they still won't fix it. So like they're, they're work, Twitter is working for the CCP, supporting Russia's, you know, dictatorial regime and suppressing Trump at the same time, which makes no sense. Then the COVID, let alone the COVID stuff. Yeah. So almost everything that was published on Twitter it, mm, was wrong. And almost everybody who had a different opinion that was turned out to be accurate was suppressed on Twitter. So fundamentally, this is what happens when you give people power to make decisions. They will either reinforce their power or they reinforce the powers that be. And the whole world of science and technology are disruptive people with disruptive ideas that prove to be right with the benefit of hindsight. Do you think uh, that, so just to back up on that, you think someone at Twitter is working with the CCP? Oh, I know for a fact. Like there are definitely spies for the CCP that work at Twitter and Google. Hmm. And, and they're suppressing stuff that they don't. hundred percent. And then fortunately, after the next election, we're going to investigate this. I'm very excited that the new regime in Congress will definitely look into what CCP spies are working at these technology companies. Interesting. I, uh, and so do you think, like, how do you actually solve this? Is it, is it just more speech and sort of letting it yes. be out there? I think this is not, again, I generally default to very basic principles and they're almost always right and everything else is noise. Anything that can be published in a book should be allowed on Twitter. So if Donald Trump can write a book, he should be able to tweet. If he wants to write something that would be banned in a book, so, you know, obscene, pornographic, we have principles for hundreds of years, actually arguably thousands, if you go back to, you know, sort of Greece and stuff, that have worked. Why are we trying to come up with new principles when we know what works? Do you, do you not think that the scale of the internet and the ubiquity of some of this stuff changes the paradigm? Like we need to rethink antitrust laws or some of these things because of the digital, you know. The I think that's bill. usually an excuse. And if someone has a reasonable argument, they should point to specifically what's different about a digital regime. But the printing press is basically all these controversies that people debate about Twitter were unlocked when the printing press happened. All the powers, all the governments that existed, all the religions that existed hated the printing press. But the printing press has been one of the best things ever for mankind. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you touched on uh, China. I can't, I can't be remiss to, uh, you have been pretty vocal anti-China uh, and other, I mean, congrats on the Midas list, but other funds out there have, uh, have entire strategies in China. What do you, like, do you think that that is at odds with being a uh, pro-U.S. American fund? Well, I definitely think it's morally and ethically at odds. It's legally permissible, which I think the law should change. I don't think it should be acceptable for an American fund to invest in China without the, without the CCP changing um, sort of either its principles or being, you know, removed from power. Yeah. But I think that's up to Congress to change the law. So they're not, viol for the most part, I don't think these funds are violating issues. the law. I think we at Founders Fund believe as American citizens, we have an obligation not to help the CCP. So we would never invest in things that would help the CCP. And we're pretty critical of funds that do. 
while taking the privileges and advantages of being an American. Has that been, has that been something I, I've noticed it of, of late? Is it something to draw a distinction more and more and call people's attention to the, you know, the potential conflicts that exist here? Well, I definitely think the agenda of the CCP is now more activist, both internally and externally. And I think therefore it's more obvious to a broader swath of the American public, how we have to confront some of these problems as opposed to ignore them. Yes. So therefore, I think there's going to be more pressure on financial services firms, just like there's going to be more pressure on corporations that do business with China. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and it, it's, I mean, the, the other thing that exists in all of this is TikTok, right? And what is possibly going to, I mean, it's, I spent a lot of time on it. Redpoint has a TikTok presence on it, right? It's an amazing platform in so many ways. And it's also absolutely terrifying, right? Yeah. So I'm not allowed to use TikTok as my guess. Um, so fundamentally. Yeah, I'm a, uh, I was an advocate of the Trump administration's tentative decision to ban TikTok. I think we should absolutely ban TikTok for a variety of good reasons. Actually, I think that one of the issues the Trump administration got into was there was two or three distinct reasons to ban TikTok. Yeah. And rather than just settle on one and you know have the policy follow that, they were trying to triangulate these three different reasons. There's an economic retaliation reason, like American social media companies are not allowed in China. Yes. Arguably, we should have reciprocal rules. But there's a national security rationale, which I think is pretty important. And I think that was probably the one that they should have pursued. And ultimately, the American administration needs to ban TikTok. Yeah. Or at least bring, like, bring the code base to the United yeah, States there or may something. Be, there may be ways to make it work otherwise. To at least minimize the national security damage. Absolutely. But there, there's have to be pretty clear, pretty transparent rules and pretty difficult to manipulate because otherwise... Definitely people will manipulate. I feel like a crazy person. Every I always get yelled at online for defending Facebook and stuff, but I'm like, at least we can call Zuckerberg to Congress, right? Like, at least we can, you know, versus TikTok, I, I think mostly gets, I mean, not a free pass. I think people are cognizant of this, but it's it's pretty scary, right? Like the amount of stuff that's going on It's there. scary. It's a great platform to influence behavior. 100%. Um, so I was actually told a pretty good anecdote that I really believe that the initial plan when um, musically sold was to basically dumb down the American kids so that China can compete better with us, <laughs> which actually is a pretty good strategy in some ways. Um, that isn't like, arguably that's not a short-term national security uh, problem, but it is actually, you know, it sort of betrays a certain mindset. Totally. Well, I think American kids are probably doing it to themselves as well. It seems at times, but yeah. Yeah. You never really know whether that's true, but I, I do think there are major issues in allowing the CCP to control content, manipulate content that affects a whole swath of the American public, we would not allow this on Twitter. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I guess kind of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, so I think almost to the day you called the market top, uh, like almost very literally, which I, you know, whatever, uh, that an amazing, uh, serendipitous, uh, prognosis of what was going on in the ecosystem. Uh, what did you see at that time of doing that? And then also like what's happened how have you internalized some of the stuff that's happened in the last couple of months since then? Yeah, to me, this is not that difficult. It, there was basically, as soon as interest rates started to go up, there was going to be a market correction. There has to be. Technologies, stocks generally generate cash flow significant years in the future. Yep. And so if you change the discount rate, the value of the company just has to change. And so the, the thing that happened in October was all these inflation deniers basically ran out of excuses. Yep. So there was this, it's transitory, it's this or that, excuses that the Biden administration was proffering. And, you know, a set of the market, a set of people were believing, you know, nonsense. It was obviously true. Like, if you look at January 1st, I posted that we're in for serious inflation this year. You know, Jack Dorsey posted we're in hyperinflation and everybody critiqued him even more so, you know, the, the, Twitter, the Twitter debate. Fundamentally, the inflation was very obvious, but there was enough excuses that the Biden administration was throwing out that people kept believing. Then finally in October, I think the administration, the Fed basically explicitly said, we have inflation. Yeah. So as soon as that cracked, I was like, duh, interest rates are going up. Well, that means technology stocks are going down. This is inevitable. Fortunately, Ari Levy from uh, CNBC, I think, um, asked me um, point blank, is this the top of the market? Uh, and yeah, I was Twitter like, threat, yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, I've internally been talking about it at a founder's fund and debating, you know, what we should be doing differently because of this. But the fact that he asked me, is this really the top of the market, happened to clarify my brain. I'm like, yeah, this actually is right now because there's no more excuses. Yeah. Inflation's real and nobody can deny it anymore. And that's basically what's happened. And interest rates you know, are probably going to continue to go up for a while. But all you have to do is monitor the inflation rate. Like This isn't rocket science at all. Every month, you get a government report card 
on the inflation rate. If inflation keeps going up, stock technology stocks are going to keep going down. If inflation stabilizes without having to raise interest rates, then either things will be stable or things might get better. But it, you don't only have to monitor one data right. point. It's not, it, this really is simple. It's a, well, it, it, every other change that I've lived through had some like very specific, almost micro thing that happened to the ecosystem Actually, or the let's macro. Let's talk about this. So 1999, so talk about the benefits of studying history. 1999, the market collapsed in 2000, yep. you know, in March and then in June. The specific cause of that was six federal uh, interest rate hikes yep. by the Federal Reserve. And 99% of the people in tech for either didn't know this or forgot it. And they all should have known it. Most journalists forgot it or shouldn't or should have known it. But if you lived through that market correction, which I did in 2000, you knew exactly what triggered it, which was the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. So it's like, if the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates again, guess what's going to happen? We're going to live through 2000 again. Totally. This is not, again, like most of life is really simple. And I was honestly, uh, it was interesting. Most of the examples that I had lived through were like, I remember in 2016 when Tableau and LinkedIn took a bloodbath, right? Yeah. And that was like, everyone was very concerned about this very small part, pocket of software and what was ultimately going to impact each other. And all those things sold off for a little while. Or then there was a very big COVID thing where it was like, hey, the fundamentals of these businesses are going to change, right? And therefore, what all is going to happen? But this was the first one that was like, I guess dating back to 99, that predates mine. But the first one that was like actually as simple as, uh, you know, interest rates, inflation, all yeah, that. Yeah, it's just like, do you ever see anybody build a discounted cash flow model? Yeah. Like, I'm like, I mean, I don't do that. As Deli has talked about publicly, I never look at these models. Yeah. But I definitely watch my colleagues and he changes me to change yeah, the exactly. variable. Exactly. I definitely could see what happens with Excel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, so what, how did you internalize that? Like what, what did you guys, how did you think about it? How'd you act on it? Where are we now? Well, we, I had started wanting us to avoid investing for the most part last summer and had some success or failures with my colleagues, uh, convincing them. Uh, Peter definitely also is a macro, uh, and is actually the best macro thinker that I know. Also believe that we're heading for a recession and inflation, et cetera. But there was so much momentum going on in the world that I don't think we were as disciplined as we should have been about like ceasing investing and being really restrictive on valuations until about October. Yeah. Then I think we did shift uh, pretty fundamentally about not being willing to chase valuations that other people were willing to pay. Last year, as I tweeted also, we were price takers. So basically the company would set the effective valuation and you could either be in or out and you could decide to compete at that price, but you didn't have a choice of resetting the price. Starting over the summer into October, we started saying, we're going to be disciplined on price and we're not going to chase valuations. Yes. But and counterintuitively, you also leaned into a handful, I mean, one that we worked together on, but you leaned in on a handful of opportunities that uh, you saw outsized potential. And w what was going through that? I know at some extent, accumulating uh, advantages that go through these markets. Yeah. Levels. I mean, to some extent, we thought we had asymmetric. Those are all companies that we were previously investors in, Ramp, for yeah. example, Kavak, yeah. et cetera. We leaned into pretty aggressively that we felt we had asymmetric information about the quality of the team, the, the caliber, you know, the opportunity, the market, et cetera. Uh, we do like concentrated bets as founders fund. We're probably most famous among LPs for concentrating our dollars yeah. into winning companies. It's a strategy that Peter and Brian and Napoleon here have really executed. It's not something I typically do, but fundamentally that's the founders fund mentality is find winners and really double, triple down. And we felt like there was some opportunities to trip, double, triple, quadruple down. Yeah. So we, in some ways, the, those are intellectually inconsistent, but also depends on timeframes. So these are all growth fund investments. The growth fund thinks in like a three or four year time horizon. My predictions about the current market are more like this month, this quarter, yeah. this year. So depending upon how you map to different timeframes, you can come up with a different answer, whether you should be leaning in or leaning back. I never wanted to pull back, for example, in seed investing. I love writing seed checks. That's my forte. I don't think there's any reason to adjust your seed strategy based upon macro di dynamics because you're going to be building a company for six to 12 years in the future. Nobody knows what the world's going to look yeah. like in six and to And it'll either years. work or it won't. And it won't be because you paid 10 or 20 no. or 50 posts nope, or whatever nope, it is. Nope. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I, I think we're going to be very aggressive in seed. I want to be as aggressive as ever funding seed companies. But by the time the series B kicks in, you need to be very judicious about what price you're paying for what risk. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. So I guess the state of the venture landscape right now, as you think about it, like, uh, so, so you lived, you started your career at the tail end of the, you know, yep. whatever the Kramlicks and the Pierre Lamont and all those guys, um, where, 
and then we've I, I I say that there was kind of the broadcast television days and the uh, cable television days, and now we're sort of in the streaming wars. Where do, what do you think is going on in the market at large? Like people are getting bigger, have gotten bigger over the last year. Do you think we're going to see a consolidation of brands that exist? What, yeah, I believe we've been you know vertically integrated. Other people have talked about it more elegantly, including one of my junior colleagues I've written about yep. this as well. I, I think this is like the law firm error. Like you have to be multi-stage or it's going to be very difficult to compete. I think brands that were very successful with focus like Meritech in the growth sector or benchmark, et cetera, are going to really struggle in this vertically integrated multi-stage environment. I think a lot of the seed funds that were doing well, solo JPs, et cetera, were kind of relying upon artificial markups yep. where everything was up into the right for the last two or three years. They looked good on paper, but until those turn into a true DPI or liquidity, they're not going to they're not going to perform anywhere near expectations. I mean, those portfolios should be written down by divide by three, yeah. uh, just to adjust to the public comparables. They don't look so hot. So I think the trend of launching a new fund, raising a hundred million dollars plus, everybody think you're the coolest fund ever. That that trend is pretty much done. Yeah, interesting. I guess one one other thread I wanted to go down was just investment. What what you look for in entrepreneurs and all that. And I I think it's. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly investing post-product market fit and you're mostly investing pre-product market fit. I, I invest in uh, dot coms. You invest in, you know, people, right? Yep. And that's literally uh, true. And, and so I feel like there's, uh, I, I always love peppering you with questions about how you actually think about that. And so it may, maybe the, the, the types of things you're looking for in entrepreneurs in general, like what makes people really spike uh, to you want to be able to write a check into them? Yeah. So my preferred course is to invest on a team and a keynote deck and nothing else. Yeah. No business metrics, no product even sometimes, but basically nothing that another investor can kind of uh, evaluate. Yeah. Once there's metrics, there's a lot of smart people in our world. And so I feel like that gets commoditized. But if you just force a decision on a deck and a team, there's very few VCs who want to write significant checks against that. So I'd prefer to compete on that dimension. The and is it mostly mostly referral based that things are coming in or what? well at that level it's often not a referral I have to intercept before anybody else gets yeah, involved yeah. because then some of them are still like people. raising rate yeah I'd prefer like nobody else being on the cap table yeah. ideally that said uh, definitely we'll look at investments from you know highly qualified referrals or even occasionally from a Twitter you know yeah, sure. a random tweet et cetera your DMs are about to be just a nightmare <laughs> um, but in, in any event. Um, there's always a spark. So the thing that leads me to want to write a check is a spark. And the spark can be different. And in fact, is different with different founders. But I have this reaction like, oh my God, I have never seen anybody like this before. And it can be like, this is the greatest salesperson I've ever met. This is the greatest storyteller I've ever met. This is the most tenacious person I've ever met. This is the smartest person I've ever met. They're very different, but there's this ear that perks. And I'm like, holy cow. If I don't feel that, I usually don't want to, I almost never want to invest. The thesis behind that is, if you think about how heroic it is to create a business in a proverbial garage with a co-founder and say, I'm going to reinvent the world, I'm going to reinvent society, I'm going to reinvent an industry, that's like borderline irrational. Yeah. And so my analysis over 40 years is the only people who actually reinvent the world have some Herculean ability in some dimension that's not normal. Otherwise, the chance you're going to reinvent the world rounds to literally zero. Yeah. So I don't want to be investing in zeros. So fundamentally, I need that spark or I won't write the chap. Another way that does resonate with me is uh, Balaji wrote this cool, well, he taught a class at Stanford called Startup Engineering, where he expressed this concept of an intellectual maze that later Chris Dixon cut and pasted into a blog. The founders who can walk you through the intellectual maze from starting to success instead of failure are very rare. And when you meet a founder who can literally draw that map, the treasure map for you, uh, I would also invest in that. Yeah, got it. Uh, uh, well, the good news is Chris won't hear this because uh, he, he blocked me a long time ago on Twitter. For, <laughs> <laughs> so he, they don't, you don't have to worry about that, uh, the copy and paste thing. Um, it's interesting. So so th is it some specific spike that, that just, like, is this totally intuitive to you? Is it something that you think can be imparted on people having, is it pattern matching over time? How do you think about that? I don't know. It's, it's, it's definitely the hardest part of venture capital to teach. Yeah. If I could teach it to more of my colleagues, I would. Um, so, and if you develop this kind of spidey sense, I think you can be a successful investor period and you're ready to write your own checks. Yeah. So if someone shows this propensity, I would embrace them, fund them, give them money for their own fund, or try to recruit them here to founders fund. So it's pretty rare. You can teach some things around pattern matching. So for example, we recently funded a founder who's about 20 years old 
who I met on a Zoom call. And my first reaction was like, oh my God, he's another Delian. It's like literally thing. like another Delian. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I called up Delian. I'm like, you have to talk to this guy. And he's like, why? And the, the idea sounded kind of crazy, but I'm like, this guy is literally you. And he, Delian didn't believe it. Then he started talking to him on the phone. He's like, oh my God, he really is like me. That's so so I found another Delian. Oh, wow. That's a, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, and that's a pattern matching experience. Was, was Delian, I mean, in general, is that like, is that an archetype or uh, obviously people are one of one in that, but like, do you have a mental model for a lot of the people you go invest with or? Um, no, but when like, when, when you see it, there's like a trait, like, so for example, let's talk about a well-known entrepreneur, Max Lovejoe. Yeah, sure. So I remember when I first joined PayPal, about three months later, Reed Hoffman came up to me and said, you know, what's special about Max? Was, no. I feel like a lot, but well, I don't know no, where you're going yeah, with this. Like, well, he's like, Max is a first-rate business mind paired with a first-rate technologist and in Silicon Valley, there's almost none of those. Yeah. And like, this is literally, this conversation happened in January 2000. Uh, yes, January 2000. Or January 2001. And so if I find someone who's a first-rate technologist and a first-rate business mind, I would definitely invest. Because yeah. like, now watching 20 years later, I'm like, you're right. There's about five of those people. Yeah. Or like Jack Dorsey is actually first rate business mind, first pretty first rate technology mind and a first rate design mind. Yeah. Which is why he's had like ridiculous success is the Venn diagram of those three things doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like Steve Jobs, you know, like there's not that many people who can do all three. Yeah. Interesting. No, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a uh, very unique traits in people. Uh, I just have Delian written down here with a question mark. I'm not sure. Well, lots of means. questions about Yeah, that. I know. I know. I I, I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, we don't need to get into that there. Uh, so I guess, uh, because we're sort of on the, the Twitter thread and, and all this, um, you know, I'm sure you've given this answer before, but uh, it's it's interesting today as you look at the people that are derivative uh, or, or, or have some lineage back to PayPal, just the number of people that are in the news today that are running, you know, different funds, different uh, different companies, all that. Like, what was it that made that unique moment in time? What, how much was uh, nature versus nurture of that specific experience that led to, I mean, Roloff's now running Sequoia. Elon's obviously his taste of Tesla, SpaceX, potentially Twitter, right? You're here. We can go down to YouTube, uh, Ma uh, uh, Max at a firm. It's just like, it's an insane, everyone knows the list, but it's insane. Yelp, LinkedIn. Yelp, LinkedIn. Yeah, all that. Like what, what was it at that moment in time or that, that either brought everyone this talent together, causation, correlation, all that? I think the number one thing was Peter Thiel and Max Lepton were just extremely excellent at assessing and hiring. So they hired a lot of very talented people who had ambition. That was the number one drive. Like, and it was really Peter hired most of the non-technical people and Max hired all the technical people. And everyone was 25 to 35? The, the age range probably was more like 21 to 35, okay. um, with some exceptions, but fundamentally that's about yeah. right. So people also had a lot of energy still. Yeah. Post, Good point in the career. Post PayPal experience. I think the bit, the difficulty of building PayPal, we had a lot of hostility from eBay, MasterCard, Visa, Amex, later post 9-11, the Treasury Department, all had issues with us. They were trying to kill us in different ways. So we had to confront a lot of challenges. And I think building a company under hostile circumstances led to bonding. So each of us bonded together. We saw, we got to witness what each of us was capable of under pressure. So building a company under stress, I think is a healthy exercise. And I think there were some lessons that we were ahead of the curve, like, David Sachs was ahead of the curve of creating a separate design team that the product people actually reported to for a while. He was ahead of the curve in rebranding product managers as producers to create value. We had some very advanced data science that Max Levchin pioneered, including like some very pioneering techniques that everybody now takes for granted, including like your CAPTCHA tests that he and a couple of engineers invented but forgot to patent because we were too busy. A lot of techniques around human and not confusing human labor and math in a very clever equation. They got on the cover of Wired Magazine back in 2000 for inventing. So there was a lot of pioneering things. We did a lot of management philosophy, anti-MBA, uh, promoting people, hiring up and coming talent that are now taken for granted across the technology world. So we pioneered a lot of ideas that have spread and that's kept us quite relevant. Yeah, it's interesting. It's amazing just all the stuff that's come out of it. Well, the last one I had, obviously, uh, Corporate takeovers of PayPal Mafia has been in the news lately. Uh, so you're going to buy Barry's takeover? Yeah, I figured it, you know, I have to, uh, Elon can afford Twitter. I, you know, I need, yeah. I need to find something I can yeah, afford. Yeah, good, good. Well, we're um, excited. And the only thing I use more than Twitter is probably Barry's. So I figured I should just buy it. No, I'm just kidding. It's much healthier for your site. I already have like three jobs. I'm like ambassador to Miami. 
I'm the CEO of a company and, you know, serve on the board of like 18 companies as an investor. I don't have, I don't have time to run various, uh, you know, as a side project. I think, I think that's probably a safe, uh, safe thing. How do you actually make all that? I guess last one, but how, how do you actually make all that time work? Like, how do you manage your day to day across? I mean, you essentially have three full-time gigs, right? Yeah. At least. Um, yeah. <laughs> I teach berries for fun. Like, yeah, actually, exactly. Too. Yeah. Um, so I think the key is to have skill set and prioritization. Um, this is like an executive trait that it developed 13 years running companies, um, which is basically what are your priorities and allocate your time against your priorities, mapping. Um, I think most people do not map their priorities and time well. So I have this thing called a calendar audit that I use with CEOs, which is I ask them, ask them to go to whiteboard and list their top three priorities on the left column. Then we go pull up their Google calendar and we compare what percentage of time do they actually spend against those hmm. three priorities. And they never really tie. Map, yeah. Like, for example, people say recruiting is my number one priority. You probably hear this in yeah, yeah, totally. all the time. Totally. I've met probably one founder in my life who actually makes recruiting. Yeah, that, it maps time based. So that. I'm always constantly doing this. Um, like, constantly. Like, every day in the morning, I wake up and do this. I do this in my interpersonal life, which drives some of my friends crazy. Yeah. I do this professionally. I do this with like fitness. I'm always like triaging time against priorities. Yeah. And that's how you get a lot more done is really for forcing yourself to prioritize strictly and then allocating the time to make sure it's in alignment and then you get a lot better output. Hmm. Interesting. Um, good deal. Well, uh, anything I didn't hit? Oh yeah, we could talk forever. Yeah, I know. This is fun. Uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. This, uh, yeah, I, a lot of, a lot of good stuff that I, uh, that I hadn't heard yet. So, um, yeah, really appreciate you doing this and I'm excited for this. This week, I don't know what percentage is going to be boondoggle uh, lessons. I mean, it's nice to actually have the first real, I think this is the first like kind of in-person event that sort of happened in a way pre-COVID. It feels like well, people are Well, not that people through. live here. Like we've had Basel, you know, yeah, which is sure. epic, ultra, sure. if you yeah. like into music. So Tech Week's a pretty substantial operation. F1 will be a substantial operation. I'm excited because I think unlike many conferences in many environments where people go for conferences, Delhi and I think we can get between 10 and 20% of the people who come here to, to move. Earth. Yeah. So that's my real goal is prove that Miami is the center of gravity and technology and then move people here that reinforces that. Well, thanks for doing this. Pleasure. All right. All right.